So today we're gonna to be modifying the injection pump on my Kubota BX. We're gonna be modifying it for more power. As you can see here, I've got the hood opened. I've got the hood bonnet off already, and I've got the loader up in the air. I did put a piece of flat stock in here. It's actually a cutting edge off of an old plow. Um, I got that underneath the loader so it doesn't settle down as we're working on it. So what we're gonna be doing today is modifying the injection pump so we can get a little bit more power out of the tractor. Now to my knowledge, nobody has ever done this before on a Kubota BX, so this will be like the very first. So the goal here today is to actually remove the injection pump, which the injection pump is this piece right here. So we're gonna be removing this injection pump and we're gonna be doing some custom work to it so that it will deliver more fuel to the injectors. Now there's three ways you can get a little bit more power out of a diesel engine. First way would be modifying the injection pump itself in some way. The other way would be to advance the timing. So there's some ways on these pumps where you could advance the timing to increase the power a little bit. And then the last way would be to adjust the fuel screw, which is behind the injection pump. Um, but that requires you to remove a tamper-proof sleeve that Kubota has put on the fuel screw where they have adjusted it so that if you go in there and adjust it, they're gonna know about it and you're gonna lose your warranty. This isn't something I'd really recommend for anybody who's got a warranty anyway. Um, I really wouldn't recommend this to too many people unless you're a guy like me who likes to modify and tinker with things. So the way we're gonna be doing it today is uh, modifying the injection pump and how I'm gonna do that is got some larger plungers that go inside of the injection pump. You've got a plunger inside the injection pump, one for each cylinder, so you've got three of them. The plungers are operated by a cam beneath the injection pump. The cam is in the engine and when the cam turns, it lifts up a lifter on the bottom of the injection pump and it pushes up on that and that's what pushes the plungers up and down to squirt fuel up into your injectors. So that's how the plungers work. Now these plungers I got on eBay. I'll show you what they look like. These are the plungers right here. They come in these little sleeves. So the stock plunger size is five millimeters. These are 5.5 millimeters. Um, so they are quite a bit bigger. It doesn't sound like much, but when you're talking with fuel delivery, um, that's quite a bit, but it's not enough to where the engine's gonna run like crap because of it. The one nice thing about upgrading the plungers instead of just turning the fuel screw is the fuel screw is only gonna increase the fuel when the tractor is under load, um, where with the plungers, it's constantly giving it more fuel throughout the entire RPM band. So whether it's at an idle, whether it's you know half revs, whether you're working it hard or not, it's constantly gonna be giving the engine more fuel so that it'll always have a little bit more power on demand, whereas the fuel screw is only under load. Um, so that's the nice thing about doing the plungers as well. The only bad thing is they're a lot more work to install versus just turning a screw on the back of the injection pump. So that is what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, first thing we gotta do is rip out the injection pump. As you can see here, there's four screws. They're Allen head bolts. So we've got one here, we've got one on this corner, and then we've got one on each corner in the back. Once you take those four out and you remove the injection lines, then you can pretty much pull the pump right out. We do have to remove the main fuel line coming from your lift pump to the injection pump. So we'll have to remove that. And then there's one smaller line right here um, and another smaller line here that we will be removing as well. And I believe these smaller lines are just for fuel return. So whatever your engine isn't using is getting returned to these smaller lines. And as you can see, it goes right back into your feed here. Um, so that's how that works. Um, I will go into a little bit more detail about how this pump works when we get it apart and get it up on the bench. But first thing first is to start removing these injector lines right here. All right, so hopefully you guys got a good view here. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is use my little hose pinch off players to pinch off this fuel line. This is the main fuel line coming from the lift pump. I'm gonna do that so I don't lose all kinds of fuel. And we wanna remove this clamp right here. And now because this fuel line's never been off before, we've got a nice little pick set that's made just for this application. It just kind of breaks that seal so that you can get the hose off. There we go. Okay, now we need to remove the smaller fuel lines. You'll see some uh, paint chipping here and there throughout this process. Okay, so we got that one done. Now we got one more line right here in the back. There we go. Okay, so we've got all the soft fuel lines off. Now we need to get all three hard lines off that go to the injectors. You're gonna need a 17 millimeter for that. And I'm hoping we'll be able to bend these lines just a little bit out of the way to get the pump out. Okay, so now we've got all three fuel lines disconnected. Now we can go ahead and pull out all four Allen bolts um, that hold the pump itself to the block. Okay, so to do this, you're gonna need an Allen socket or a T30 Torx. It's actually an Allen bolt, but I'm using the T30. All 
Now I should just be able to get these by hand. Now these back ones, they actually are a sleeve, so they're a stud that come through the pump, and then this is like a big nut. Okay, so now this pump should be ready to come out of here, I believe. Yep, it's loose. Let me get you guys repositioned, maybe in a better spot here, and I'll see if we can get this pump wiggled out of here. One thing I did notice just now is there's a lock washer on these back studs, so make sure you don't lose that. So it's probably gonna take some wiggling here to get this thing free. There we go. Basically, I just kept wiggling it back and forth. So now we're hung up on the injection lines. So we wanna bend these up just a little bit. You can kind of see the pump pop out of there. Okay, I've got them bent up just a little bit. And now the pump should come right out. There we go. You guys can kind of see how I was holding up on them lines. And there's the injection pump. Alrighty guys, so I've got the injection pump drained. This is what the pump looks like itself. Pretty small, I can see compared to the size of my hand. Um, so this is what we gotta tear into to install these plungers here. So let me get this thing wiped down a little bit and then I'll show you guys the process in taking this thing apart. Okay guys, so I've got the injection pump all cleaned up and wiped off. Um, you wanna keep your work area nice and clean. You don't want to contaminate the inside of this pump. So you wanna keep the internals very clean as you go along. Now I just wanna to talk to you guys real quick about some of the issues you can have with a Kubota diesel engine, mainly their super compact diesel engines. Now these injection pumps between the two cylinders, three cylinders and four cylinders, they're all designed roughly the same. They all look pretty much identical to this injection pump. So seeing this one rebuilt is gonna be pretty much the same exact procedure to rebuild a four cylinder or a two cylinder. Now typically if something is to go wrong on one of these engines, it's gonna be within the injection pump itself. A lot of times this fuel rack right here, this is the fuel rack that delivers the fuel to the engine when you hit the throttle it pulls this rack and delivers more or less fuel to the injectors and that's what makes the engine rev up so one of the things that can go is this fuel rack right here it can seize up and if that seizes up you won't be able to get the thing to run sometimes it'll seize in the stop position if it say the engine has sat for many years this could be seized in the stop position which is actually this way and if that seized that way the engine is never going to start because it's never going to get any fuel um, another issue that happens is these little uh, lifters right here, which I was talking about earlier in the beginning of the video. These are spring loaded. As you can see here, I could push on them. Now these are what pumps up and down off of the cam. They've got little rollers on the bottom here. So the cam rolls on these and pushes these up and down. And when it pushes them up and down, it uses those plungers that we're going to be replacing today to pump the fuel up through the delivery valves and to the injectors. So that's how that works. And what can happen is sometimes these springs could break in these. So if you ever pull your pump out and you've got an issue and you, you notice that one of these lifters here is really weak or one of them is just kind of flapping up and down, then you could pretty much guarantee that there's a broken spring inside here. And that would be the cause of the issue. Um, typically, when a spring breaks, you're going to have a really rough running engine. You might get a lot of white smoke um, because one of the cylinders is not getting fuel so you're only running basically on two cylinders and it's going to make it smoke a lot um, and it's not going to run right so that could be another issue and the last issue would be like the collars on the inside that this fuel rack actually turns sometimes those can seize up now there's one for each cylinder so there's one here one here and one here and that's what this fuel rack moves and what it does is it rotates them, it rotates the sleeve on the plunger itself to increase or decrease the amount of fuel that the plunger is able to push up to the injector. So sometimes those independently can freeze and that'll also freeze the rack up. So between those issues, that's typically what'll go wrong with one of these injection pumps. And if that goes wrong, sometimes it can actually take out the motor if it's dumping too much fuel into it and washing the cylinder walls or what have you. Now, I'm not a diesel expert, and this is actually one of the first injection pumps, at least for a small Kubota that I've taken apart. So if I get any of these specific names um, incorrect, don't, uh, don't shoot the messenger because I'm just doing the best I can to explain, um, to my knowledge, how these pumps work. So that all being said, let's go ahead and dive into this. Here are the new plungers. These are the aftermarket plungers I got off eBay. Um, they cost about $55 each, so this is $150. You're going to need to buy three of them. Um, like I said, this will deliver more fuel throughout the entire RPM band. Hopefully, it's not going to be too much fuel with the engine being naturally aspirated, but I do have plans down the road to potentially add a turbo to this engine. Um, so I figure I get this out of the way now so it's done, and then someday when I want to put a turbo on the engine, I can do that knowing I got plenty of fuel for the air to clean it up. So this is the plunger itself. As you can see, this gets pushed up and down. And when this pushes up and down, it actually shoots the fuel out the top here, which goes through these delivery valves and up to the injection pump. So 
when that rack rotates, it's rotating the plunger. So it rotates this or it rotates the plunger here and then that adjusts your fuel. So depending on how much fuel you need, this rack will move back and forth which spins these left and right, and that in turn determines exactly how much fuel each injector is gonna get. So that's how that works. Just wanted to kind of go through the basics real quick before I broke this pump apart. I'll go ahead and put this back in the casing so it doesn't get damaged. So let's go ahead and dive into this thing. The first thing we're gonna have to do here is mark the delivery tubes. I wanna mark each one of these because I heard that if these are not set exactly where they were from factory, it can affect your timing. And I definitely don't wanna do that. So I've got a paint marker here. And I'm gonna mark each one of these delivery tubes and each one of these barrels going down into the injection pump. So what I wanna do here is I wanna mark each one of these delivery tubes, which is the top part here. So I just wanna make a mark just like that. So when I unscrew this, I can make sure I put it back in the exact same spot to make sure the timing stays the same. I wanna mark these as well because these holes are slotted. So that is another adjustment point. So I wanna make sure that I mark these so I can put them back in the exact same spot. Okay, so now you guys can see how I've got this marked. I've got everything marked so everything can go back exactly the way Kubota had it from the factory because what we're doing today is not gonna affect timing at all. So we wanna make sure we keep everything else exactly the same. Okay, so now that we've got all that done, we can go ahead and tear this apart. So the first step is gonna to be to remove this little retaining clip. This needs to get popped off so that we can take these rollers out. The next thing is, you guys will see there's three little dowel pins and what they do is they hold these little lifters or rollers in place. Um, so since they're spring loaded, you've gotta push up on them. So I'm gonna grab my finger here, my index finger, and I'm gonna push up. And then as I push up, I'm gonna to try to pull out this dowel pin. Go ahead and set that to the side. Now all these pieces you're gonna to wanna to keep in order. So everything from this cylinder here, I wanna keep together. Same with the middle one and same with the end one. Um, that way you have no fear of mixing stuff up because everything is worn and broken into the cylinders or the sleeves that they're in right now. So we wanna make sure that we keep them exactly where they're at. So now we can go ahead and pull this out. And you can see right here the hole that that pin went in. Go ahead and set this to the side. Now we've got that out. There's gonna be a retaining clip in here. So we need to get that retaining clip off of the plunger. So let's try to get this retaining clip out of the way. Actually wasn't even under that tight. So as you'll see, it's actually slotted. So that goes around it like that and it gets pushed up. So there's a the retaining clip. And then next is the plunger itself. So there is the plunger. That is the stock plunger, the one we're gonna be replacing. Set that to the side. Next is gonna be a spring. And then lastly is a collar and the piece that actually turns the plunger itself. If you guys can see, there's like a little dowel pin on there or a little nub. That nub is what's actually grabbing on this fuel rack right here. So when this fuel rack moves back and forth, it's actually rotating this piece right here, which rotates the collar and then it rotates that plunger, I believe. And that's how it regulates the fuel flow. So now that we've got all that out of there, you can see we pretty much got an empty, uh, an empty cylinder. Now I'm gonna go ahead and remove the upper delivery tube because we still need to get to one more piece that we're replacing that is the upper half to this plunger here. So the size of this is a 17 millimeter, same as the injector lines were. There we go. Now this has got a spring under it as well. So there's gonna be some tension when you unscrew this. As you'll see there, it's sealed by a little red O-ring. Go ahead and pull that off. Nothing else in there. Here is the spring that was pushing up against it. Inside of here are the pieces we need to get to. So we'll go ahead and tip this down. As you'll see here, there's like a collar and inside of it is kind of like its little own plunger. It's some kind of like a valve. And then there's also a little washer here that you don't want to lose that goes on top of this. So that's another piece here that we just got to put back in. And then there's one more piece, which is this one right here. And this is the part that we we're looking for. This is the upper portion to the plunger. So this is the other piece we're gonna be replacing along with this piece right here. And this slides into this like this. So that's the pieces we wanted. That's what we're gonna be replacing. So basically we gotta throw these back in and then we gotta put that whole side back together. Um, but before we do that, we're just gonna take it all apart because you cannot get to the middle one without taking the end ones off anyway. So we're just gonna disassemble all of this. So you wanna make sure you keep, like I said, each cylinder um, together. So we'll put everything over here in one pile and we'll make three piles here and then we're gonna have to put everything back together when we're done and make sure all of our marks line up now i did think that we had to remove these tamper proof torques and get this barrel out but luckily we didn't have to i was able to just give it a little knock and that last piece for the upper plunger slid right out of the barrel 
So luckily we will not have to take any more apart than what we did right here. So now we go ahead and do the rest of it. But first I wanna take this fuel rack off cause it needs to come off anyway. Um, if you guys are doing this in the very beginning, you can go ahead and just take this off right from the start. So I've got a Phillips here. We just go ahead and take out these four Phillips bolts. Okay, so there's those four screws. So once you've got them off, you can go ahead and pull the sleeve off. And under the sleeve is gonna be the fuel rack itself. This fuel rack will actually come out of the sleeve. So you've got the plate here, and then you've got the fuel rack. Now, like I said earlier, you had those little nubs that the fuel rack rotated. That is these little nubs right here. These rotate, see how I just pushed it? Them rotate, and that's what turns that sleeve and limits or increases the amount of fuel that those plungers are pumping. The biggest thing is, is making sure you've got your plunger back in the correct order or orientation, because there's two ways this can go in. You can either put it in this way or 180 degrees out. If you got it the wrong way, the engine's either not gonna run at all or it's gonna run terrible. And there's the fuel rack. You can see how it's slotted there. And that's what grabs those nubs and rotates them. Now we can go ahead and move on to these other two here. So we're just gonna repeat the process. Pull that pin out. I'm actually gonna move this stuff over so I got some room here. Now there's another piece that you gotta make sure you worry about getting the right orientation. This is a shim. This goes underneath the spring. These shims increase or decrease the timing as well. You'll see it's numbered, but they all have different numbers on them. You gotta make sure that that number is facing the correct direction. So I'll show you guys that when we put it together. But if you have this reversed or flipped around, you're definitely gonna have running issues. You gotta make sure all this stuff goes back in the right way. So just make sure when everything comes apart, you're keeping a very close eye on the orientation of everything. So let's go ahead and pull this one out. Get that roller out of the way. There's nothing in it. It's just a roller. And then right beneath that roller is that little uh, shim I was just telling you guys about. Go ahead and pull that out. This one's numbered 07, I believe. That's going to face towards the roller just like that. Now we can pull out that retainer again. Then we can get our plunger out of the way. Then our spring. Then we've got our collar and the piece with the nub that rotates back and forth with the rack. And that's it, nothing else in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this other delivery tube off. Got our small spring that's underneath it. Inside are gonna have these three pieces. And then lastly, we've gotta get the upper half of that plunger out. Last time I kind of shook it, but I think this time I'll just kind of push it out. It's that little sleeve that you can see in there. It needs to be pushed outwards to the top. See if I can knock it out with a flat head. There we go. And there it is right there. Gets press fitted into there. There is a pin on the inside of that bore. So you gotta make sure that that pin is lined up with this slot right here when it goes back together. Okay, now we've got two of them completely emptied. Just gotta do the last one here. So I'm gonna do that without talking. We'll get that one done and then we can start cleaning things up and going through the assembly process. All right guys, I don't know how well you could see this, but there are three pins on the inside of here. You wanna make sure you don't lose them. When you're kind of sliding everything out and tipping it around, you gotta make sure that those three pins don't fall out. Uh, one thing I did wanna mention is I was talking about failure points. One of the things that also fails is the plungers here. You got your upper and lower piece. Sometimes I've seen these actually get stuck. So if you got some really contaminated fuel or a lot of water in it, this plunger has such a tight tolerance in the sleeve right here that if there's any kind of water or rust starting to form in there, this plunger will get seized in the sleeve here. Um, so that is another issue that causes problems with these engines. Now, none of these problems are very common at all. And as long as you keep clean fuel, you really won't have any of these issues for probably the life of the engine. But this is some failure points. I just wanted to point them out in case you do have an engine that you bought that was used, or maybe you had an engine that was sitting around many years and now it doesn't run right. Um, um, those are the failure points that can happen, and this is just one more of them. So let's go ahead and start throwing these back together. We'll get rid of the factory plungers, and we'll install the upgraded ones. We'll get it all put back together, and hopefully this thing runs when we're done. We're going to start on the right side here as I've marked it, and that indicated that those are from these parts here. So once we get those parts in, I know that that's the center one, and then that's the end one. So the first thing we're going to have to do is grab one of our new plungers. We want to separate it from the upper half here, the cylinder, and then we can go ahead and throw this in the cylinder bore here. So that cutaway slides into that pin, and that's what locks this in a certain orientation. Drop that on in there. You're gonna have to take like your pinky or some kind of a tool and rotate that until it falls into the notch and slips all the way down into the bore. Okay, I just pushed mine in. You can see how far down it's in there. So I know that that's seated into place now. Once you know you got that right, let me go ahead and install this piece right here. And this is gonna go in with that fatter part there. That fat ring is gonna go towards the bottom. Drop all that in there. 
Get your washer in there, make sure it's all seated in there. Once you've got that in there, you can go ahead and take that small spring, put that on top, it kind of sits on that little dowel pin right there. So it sits like that. And then once you've got that in there, you go ahead and put the delivery tube back on. Just make sure your O-ring is in good shape. Um, wouldn't hurt to lube it up with a little bit of diesel fuel. I've already got diesel fuel on it, so I'm just gonna rub it around. Go ahead and slide that over the top, thread it into place. And then for now, I'm just gonna snug it down because I'm gonna have to line it up with those marks when I get done. And it's gonna take quite a bit of force, so I'll probably put this in the vise so that I can get it to the exact same spot. Okay, so now we've got the delivery tube in place. Now we can go ahead and flip it over. The first thing we need to put in this little collar with that piece with the nub on it I was telling you guys about earlier that rotates. So these two pieces go in um, basically together. You could put this piece in first. Basically, you're gonna face that nub towards that open window there where the rack went. Make sure it sits all the way in there and you can see that nub now. So that's all the way in place. Then we can go ahead and put this little collar in. This is gonna go in with the dish part up because the spring actually sits inside this collar. Make sure that's down all the way. There we go. Once you know that's in there all the way, then we go ahead and install our new plunger. This piece we do not need anymore. That's that upper plunger piece. That was the original. We can get rid of that and we can get rid of the old plunger, which is right here. So now we go ahead and remove the new plunger from the casing here. Now, this is the crucial part. You got to make sure you get this plunger correct because you can install it 180 degrees out. Um, from my understanding, which I hope this is right, you will see like an M20 or an M30 on one side. That needs to be facing up towards that window. Or you could also take it from that slot right there. You can see that groove or that slot that's cut in a pin. If you turn it this way, there's no slot in there. Um, you could see there's a flat spot here and a flat spot here. So if you're turning it the narrow way, you could see there's no groove on this pin this way. And then when you go 180 degrees the other way, It'll say M20 or M12 right here. Kind of see that imprint right there. So that needs to face towards a window or that cut groove right there needs to face towards that window. So orientate it that way, facing the window. And then what's gonna have to happen is you could see that piece that rotates in there that we dropped in there. You could see how it's kind of like oval shaped. That seats this part right here on the pin. Now you don't wanna put it in all the way. Just get it started. Make sure it's lined up with that uh, oval in there. Once that's in there, we can go ahead and drop our spring in. And then we're going to put our retaining clip in there. So you want to start with the wide part there, move it over, and then let it drop in place. And then you can go ahead and push this pin down until it seats into that rotating assembly. So that's seated in place now. So now when this thing rotates right here, it'll rotate on the um, plunger there. So that's all the way in there and you can tell because it's flush with the top of the retainer. So we've got that seated all the way in there. Now our last step is to install the specific um, shim for the cylinder. So we're on this cylinder. That's why I keep everything in order. I'm going to go ahead and drop this in. You want to make sure that the numbers that are written on it are facing outwards. Don't flip it around or it won't be right. Make sure the numbers are facing towards you. Go ahead and set it in there. And our last piece is going to be this roller right here. You're just going to carefully drop that into place. And you want to make sure when you put this in, you orientate the slotted area towards that hole where we pulled the pin out from earlier. So now you go ahead and push down on this. Take your pin that we pulled out in the beginning and drop your pin in place. And that'll retain the roller. You'll know when that pin is in place because this roller will only come back out so far. So we've got that in there. That's it for that side. So now we can go ahead and move on to the middle and then we'll do the end one. All right, guys, so now that I've got this side done, what I'm gonna do is do these two together, basically. So I'm gonna put both plunger sleeves in at the same time and we'll put the upper halves together at the same time as well as thread in our delivery valves. That way the entire top section is done. That way I could tighten all these up together and get them lined up with my marks. And then once that's done, all we gotta do is flip it around and load these last two cylinders and we should be ready to throw this thing back in. Okay, so we've got the new upper sleeve here. Go ahead and line up our mark there. Got our little cutaway there. Go ahead and angle that down. Drop that in. Take our other one here. Find that cutaway. Drop it down in there. Okay, so now we've got the upper barrels in. Now we can go ahead and finish installing the upper portions of these. We'll start with the middle one here. Got to grab this piece again with the little washer. Drop that in there. Then you put your little spring in, and then we can go ahead and put our delivery valve back on again. Make sure your O-ring looks good. Okay, I just got done bringing it to the vise. I tightened these up. As you can see, I lined my marks back up. Got that one lined up, that one lined up. Had to do that before I put this last one in, otherwise I wouldn't be able to get to the middle one. So these ones are completely done now. Now we go ahead and finish putting the top one together here. Okay. 
Okay, so now I just gotta tighten this up the rest of the way, get that mark to line up with that mark, and we'll be all done with the top half. All right guys, so I've got the last delivery valve all tightened up. You can see my mark is lined up there. Same with the other three, so we're all good there. And we just gotta reassemble the rest of this. So let's go ahead and get that done now. That's it. So we've got everything installed back into the cylinders here. So now all we've got left to do is to install the rack. So on the rack, you'll see we've got three notches. We've got to line those up with those three metal nubs. So try to get all of them as centered as you can before you start this. It can only go on one way. And I'll show you that when we get to put the uh, last piece on. Line all three of those marks up with those nubs and it'll drop right in place. And you want to make sure that this rack moves easily back and forth. So it should slide with very little resistance. Once you know that's all good, then you know that everything is assembled correctly and we can go ahead and put on our cover plate. So you can see here how that can only go on one direction because the cover plate's got one hole in it. And we can start all four of our screws. So we should be all set now. Again, just make sure your rack moves back and forth. You can see how easily mine moves. So that's exactly how it should be. Now that fuel screw I was telling you guys you can adjust. Um, what that fuel screw actually does is it allows this rack to travel farther. So it allows this rack to go a little bit farther than it normally would. And the farther the rack travels, the more fuel it allows the plungers to pump into the injectors. So now we're all set. We've got the entire pump back together. All of our rollers here are nice and free. Our springs are working. So let's just throw this retainer on real quick and we'll get it slapped back in the tractor. I'm just gonna wanna start it in that little groove right there on one side. Once you get it started in the one side, you can just pull it across. You'll see how it drops right into all the flathead bolts here, or pins. Once you drop it in all of them, you can go ahead and snap it on the back side here. Just like that. So you can see how that looks now. Okay, so let's go ahead and throw this back in the tractor, and uh, we'll see if it runs. All right, guys, so we're back over at the tractor now. Just want to show you real quick that gasket I was telling you about. Well, it's like a gasket, but it is a shim, and like I said, it's for timing. Let me see if I can get it pulled off here. I've already tatted it off to clean it. So this is the shims they use for timing. So you could add or remove these depending on if you want to advance or retard your timing. Typically, if you want to make more power, you're going to want to advance the timing on a diesel. I want to show you something else as well. When you shut your tractor off on a diesel, they have a shutoff solenoid. This is the shutoff solenoid right here. What it does is that when it activates, it pulls this lever over. So that pulls that fuel rack all the way to one side. And when it does that, it puts the plungers in a position to where they can no longer pump fuel to the injectors. So the plungers will still operate up and down, but because they rotate, they rotate to a point to where it closes off the hole. And that's how they're able to continue to run up and down without putting more fuel to the engine. So it does that and it immediately stops the fuel going to the injectors, which kills the engine. So when we put this pump back in, as you can see, that lever's got a notch in it. We got to make sure that we pull this out a little bit so that we drop that pin on the fuel rack down in through that notch. So it's crucial to make sure it's in there correctly. And then when you get it in there, it should drop all the way down into place. And the first thing we're going to check before we start this thing up is to make sure for one, we're squirting fuel out of all three holes on the injection pump when I turn it over. And for two, we want to hold the fuel rack all the way to its off position to make sure the fuel stops. This way, if you have a problem, you don't end up with a runaway diesel. You definitely want to check that first and I'll show you guys how to do that. All right, guys, I've got the light set up. So hopefully you guys can see see exactly what I'm doing here. So again, this little lever right here needs to go through this little cutaway and it needs to drop down into the lever down in here. So I'm gonna kind of pull these fuel lines back. See if we can squeeze the pump down in there. Definitely went in easier than it came out. So now what we need to do is make sure that that rack goes into that lever. So I believe I'm in now. The stop lever actually has some resistance to it, so I can kind of feel that it's connected. So now what I gotta do is kind of work this pump down in all the way. Um, I'll probably have to use the nuts on the back to kind of work it down. But if I push down hard on it, you guys can kind of see how it springs. So I basically just gotta fight that spring pressure and make sure it settles all the way down. As long as it goes all the way down, you know you're pretty much in, I believe. Um, if you're not in right, you won't be able to push down on the pump and get it down all the way flush with the block. Um, so. You could push down on it like I am right now. Like right now it's flush the block. I know I'm pretty much in. I believe that lever is in because of the resistance I feel. 
on the stop lever. So should be good. Let me go ahead and see if I can get a nut started here. Got to kind of hold down on the pump. And I'm going to start these nuts in the back first. Okay, so I've got the two back nuts started. It's pretty much flush with the base. And as you can see here, I could push down and make the pump completely touch the surface of the block. I'm going to go ahead and hold down on it and get the two front ones installed. And I'm sure there's a torque spec for these bolts, but... I kind of felt the way they were when I took them off. They were just basically snug, so I'm just going to snug them back up. Shouldn't matter as long as the pump is tight. Shouldn't make much difference. So now what we're going to do is reinstall the fuel lines. Okay, so now we've got the fuel lines hooked back up. We can go ahead and bleed the pump. So we got to get the fuel to the pump and bleed all the air out of it. So we're going to go ahead and crack loose this 10 millimeter bleed bolt. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is turn on the key so we can get the lift pump running. We'll let the lift pump run until we see no more air bubbles coming out of this bleed bolt, and then I'll tighten it back up. Go ahead and tighten it down. Okay, good there. Okay, so now that we've got that tight, what we wanna do is make sure the shutoff solenoid is still working properly. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut the key off, and we'll make sure the shutoff solenoid is working. Now we gotta make sure it's working properly and that it's actually shutting off the fuel. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn the key over and what we should see is fuel bursting out of each one of these delivery valves. So we gotta check that. And then the other thing we're gonna do is make sure that if the stop solenoid is held closed while I'm turning the key over, we should see fuel stop flowing out of these delivery valves. So as long as all that works and we can go ahead and install our last remaining three lines, start this thing up and see what happens. So it took a little bit. At first, we're only getting fuel out of this guy right here. And then I blocked that one off and we started getting fuel out of this one. I blocked that one with a rag and I started getting fuel out of the center one. So now we know that we've got fuel coming out of each one of these delivery valves. Now we're gonna do is reinstall the injection lines. But before we do that, I just wanna make sure that the stop valve is working correctly so we don't have a runaway situation. So I'm gonna go ahead and tie the stop valve over and I'll turn it over again. And when I do that, we should get no fuel out of any one of these delivery valves. I'm gonna have to throw a rag over this so you guys really won't be able to see it because I'm throwing diesel all over the shop here. So I really just wanna cover it up, but you guys won't be able to see it. So I'm just gonna shut the camera off while I do this. I just wanna make sure that this is working properly. If it's not working correctly, it's because I don't have that little paw coming off the rack into the little slot that's in the bracket for the stop valve. So I just got to pull the pump back up, readjust the rack and make sure I have it slotted into the stop valve here. So let me try it real quick again off camera. We just make sure all this is working properly and I'll bring you guys right back. All right guys, so I figured out what the issue was. Um, I think I had a couple different things going on. I don't believe I was slotting the rack of the pump into the stop bracket correctly. So I think that was one of the issues. And I think that's why when I was holding over, it wasn't stopping. But that's kind of a good thing because it led me to actually take the whole pump back out. And what I did was I removed the plungers again just to make sure I had them orientated correctly. And what I found out after doing a little bit more research was I had them 180 degrees out. So as I was telling you guys earlier, when I was building the pump, the way I told you guys to install them, basically these plungers can only go in one of two ways. So it either goes in like this, or it goes in like this. The side with the writing on it will always have this notch on the plunger. You can see how it's notched out. That is the side I've been referring to as like the M20 or M30, and that is the size of the plunger. So that'll always be lined up with this notch. So the way I told you guys to install it was to install the notch or the writing towards the rack side. Well, on these Kubota BX pumps, I didn't realize that the fuel inlet is on the opposite side of most of the other injection pumps that I looked at when I was looking at diagrams on how to rebuild these. Um, so because of that inlet side being on the opposing side of the pump, that means these plungers have to be flipped 180 degrees. So instead of pointing that slot or the writing towards the rack of the pump, you're going to flip it 180 degrees and point it away from the rack. Um, so that's the best way I can describe it to you guys. So if you're ever doing this on your own, just make sure the writing or the notch is facing away from the rack or towards the fuel inlet. I'll show you real quick what the fuel inlet is. 
So here is the fuel inlet on the pump. The fuel pump diagrams that I looked at, all of the fuel pump inlets were on the opposing side of the pump. The rest of the pump was exactly the same. Um, so I didn't pay no attention to it. Didn't even realize that that would have made anything assembled differently. Um, and then, like I said, when I had this problem, kind of glad I did because it made me open the pump back up and look at the plungers again just to make sure I had installed them correctly. And when I looked back over the diagram, I had noticed this one difference. So then I would found a different diagram with the fuel inlet on the correct side, the same side as this one. And as soon as I did that, I saw that the plungers were reversed. So now that I've done that, I've retested it and the pump works fine. I'm getting fuel out of it. And when I hit the stop lever, the fuel is stopping. So let me just show you guys that process really quick. I just want to show you guys what to look for so that you guys can be safe when you're doing this to make sure the fuel shuts off before you actually hook the injection lines up and try to start the engine. Now what I'm going to do is take my little mechanics wire that I already have tied to the stop lever. I'm going to grab it and I'm going to pull it up and around this stop bolt here. And then I'm going to return the engine over and you'll see that the fuel will be cut off and it will no longer be throwing fuel out of the ejection pump. Okay, so as you guys can see there, big difference. We've got fuel squirting out with the stop valve open. And then with the stop valve closed with a wire tied like I had it, there was no fuel shooting out of the injection pump. So now we know we should be in good shape to finish hooking up all three steel injection lines. So we'll go ahead and get that done now. And then we're gonna give this thing a test and see how it runs. Okay. All right, guys, so I've got the entire pump back together. I double checked all of my lines. I also cleaned up all the fuel. That way, in case we have a leak, we'll be able to see it right away. So we should be all set to give this thing its first start. I did not bleed the injector lines going from the pump to the injectors. Once you've got the injection pump bled, it'll bleed the injector lines out pretty quickly. So I'll just have to turn it over a few extra revolutions. Um, so don't be surprised if it don't start right away. All right guys, well as you can see, that was successful. I'm really happy about that. We've got no fuel leaks on the injection pump itself. Um, didn't even manage to knock off too much of the gray powder coat, which I'm kind of happy about because I didn't want to mar the pump all up and have it looking like crap when I got done. So really happy, I didn't really chip too much paint off of it. Um, at some point, I do want to go through in the summertime and detail this. I'm going to clean it up really good. I'm going to touch up any paint spots on the tractor and just get it looking like brand new again. That is one of my jobs that I want to do this summer. Um, it definitely pours some black smoke out now. That wasn't exactly my intention, but I did know it was going to be a bit smokier than stock because those plungers were quite a bit bigger. And my entire purpose of doing this was to add some more fuel to see if there was going to be some kind of a power gain. Now, I don't have a rear PTO dyno. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, but that would be the ultimate way to really see what kind of power I gained here But unfortunately, I don't have a dyno like that So what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and work this thing probably the rest of the winter part of the summer and see if I notice a difference Hopefully it's not too smoky. I don't think it's gonna be it's mainly just gonna smoke when you rev it up Or when you lug it really really hard, but I don't think it's gonna be really too bad If it is bad, that's okay too because the whole other reason I put these plungers in was because at some point I do plan on putting a turbo kit on this um, I plan on building my own turbo kit for this engine and when you throw a turbo on 
Bondis, you got to have extra fuel. Otherwise, you're not going to make any extra power. So you can put all the air into these diesels you want. But if you don't have the fuel there before you give it extra air, you're not going to make any extra power. So that was the main reason I want to put these in there. And I was going to wait until I got the turbo kit done. But I figured what the heck I had them here already. I had bought them a couple months ago. I figured I'd throw them in for an experiment just to kind of see how it was before I do a turbo kit. If there is any sort of power gain to be had just by doing the plungers. And if there is, if I do notice a difference, I will be sure to let you guys know. I'll let you guys know if I have any issues with reliability or anything like that, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. So I'm going to go ahead and get the tractor wrapped back up and I will catch up with you guys to close out this video. All right, guys, and there you have it. The first Kubota BX with a modified injection pump and a hood stack. Uh, the tools you guys are going to need for this job, I just want to show you guys before I close the video out here. Uh, I used a flathead screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver. I used a little pick to break loose some of the hoses and to get some of the smaller parts out of the injection pump. We've got a pair of pliers here, needle nose pliers, to get all the clips off of the fuel lines. I've got a pair of pinch off pliers for the main fuel line going into the injection pump, the main feed line. Got a quarter inch ratchet, quarter inch extension with a T30 Torx. That's what I use to get the Allen bolts out of the injection pump. There's four of them. Got a 10 millimeter wrench here for bleeding out the pump for the bleed screw. And we've got a 17 millimeter wrench here for the injection lines and the top delivery valve. So that's pretty much all you're gonna need to do this job, pretty simple. And if you follow my video, you guys shouldn't have any problems. I also used some mechanics wire to hold that stop lever in place when I dropped the pump in. And then I used it again to make sure the fuel was getting cut off um, when the key was shut off. So um, that's definitely important to do to make sure you're not gonna start the engine up and not have any way to shut it off. Um, so hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative. I know it's gonna be probably one of the first videos online with a Kubota BX doing something like this. So hopefully the video gets a lot of use and guys find it really helpful. Um, I will be doing some more testing with this and uh, we'll definitely be putting the tractor to work and I'll be letting you guys know if I notice any kind of power increase. Someday if I can get a hold of a PTO dyno, I will do a dyno test for you guys to kind of see what kind of power we got. Maybe we can do it before and then after the turbo. Um, but I believe I got plenty of fuel now for a turbo kit. And if I ever needed more fuel, I could always adjust that fuel screw. One last thing I want to mention is when you're adding turbo kits or even just adding more fuel like I did, you're not going to notice an engine speed difference, an RPM difference. You're not going to even notice a horsepower difference if you're not working a tractor. So just driving it normally and whatnot, you're not going to see a difference. we are really going to see a difference when you're putting more power to these is in the PTO horsepower or when you've got the tractor under a constant load. That's where you really get the power benefits from when you're doing these kind of modifications. We all know that these engines already make more power than they could put to the ground. Um, so that's not an issue. That's not the power I wanted to increase. The main power I wanted to increase was the power under a full load. When you're working the machine hard and you've got the RPMs cranked and you're lifting something heavy or you've got something on a rear PTO like a stump grinder or a brush hog or even when I'm out mowing lawn, uh, I should notice a power increase because you've got that constant load that's on the engine constantly lugging the engine down. Just wanted to say that real quick before I end this. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like I said, hopefully you guys found it useful. Uh, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Yeah, I'm going to get inside and enjoy the rest of my weekend. Hope you guys have a good rest of your weekend. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, and as always, we'll see you guys in the next one.